Chris Van Sant. Flew in from Denver. All right. All right, is this working? You'd need to press both buttons at the same time. Perfect. Can everybody hear me? I can. <laughs> can you hear me in the back, Ben? Good? Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much for having us out today. Um, obviously, today we're here to talk about full funnel strategies. What Henry and I focus on is digital advertising and how to get your content out there. So let's go ahead and jump in and let's talk about the sales funnel a little bit. Actually, we'll start, start here. We are going to talk a lot more about the sales funnel, but envision yourself planning a trip. Now, when you're starting to look for vacation spots, obviously you have to take a lot into consideration. Where do you want to go? Who's going to be coming with you? A lot of different choices that you need to make. Then you want to take consideration into account here. You want to look at a couple different options, maybe the location, maybe the hotel, maybe the activities that you want to do while you're there. And then you want to start making some decisions. The full funnel or the sales funnel as we like to refer to it involves the exact same thought process. We want to make sure that your company is getting all of these things taken into account so that we can get people to convert. So let's talk a little bit about the sales funnel a little more. So we want to talk about the top of the sales funnel. There's a lot of different products that are going to be involved in the sales funnel, but let's start at the top and talk about creating branding, awareness, and interest in your particular product or service. We use a lot of different products here. We can use everything from a regular TV commercial to streaming TV commercials, display advertisement, email, as Brittany alluded to earlier. Um, we can talk a little bit about SEO, and then obviously social media plays a huge part these days as well. You know, typically for the sales funnel, this is, this is built to get your brand out there, to create awareness, and to make sure that you have people that are clicking on your website, that we're generating traffic to that site, and that we're getting people in your front door. There's a lot of different ways that we're going to do it. Um, and we'll definitely open this up for questions at the end as well. So right, jot those down. So let's talk a little bit about programmatic display. Program programmatic display is a really interesting tool that we use. And I consider it like a digital banner. You want to make sure that you have really well built out display ads, whether that's video or static ads. And then we want to talk about where we're getting the inventory, or in other words, where we're running your ads. We use a company called The Trade Desk. This is basically the stock exchange for available inventory that's out on the internet. Picture all of the websites that you use on a daily basis with advertising. We're literally going in and we're bidding on that available inventory and we're taking your creatives and we're placing that advertisement in those specific locations. This is typically done through means of targeting that Brittany mentioned earlier. So we'll go into that in a little bit more depth. But we just wanted to mention that the DSP that we work with is the largest in the United States. And in our opinion, it is the most active and best tool that we can be using on a daily basis. So here are a couple examples. And I really like to show this because a lot of people get fixated on the sites that their ads show up on. And I certainly understand that. But we really want to take into account who we're looking to reach. We want to find the right audience, and we want to make sure that we get your ad in front of those people um, by all the different demographic content that we will that we'll go through here in a little bit. Now, as you can see here, we're talking about the Wall Street Journal, ESPN, it could be Fox News, it could be CNN. Whatever it is, we want to use the tools on the next slide to target those people. So we talk about behavioral targeting. We always like to joke around that we can target redheaded, left-handed golfers if we need to. Now, obviously, that's a pretty niche market. So we can open that up. We can do wide branding and awareness campaigns to people in this particular geographic area, or we can narrow that down to a really niche group of people. We always take content into consideration. If you want to run on new sites or you want to run on sports-related content, that's all options that we can include in our advertising strategy. Now, we've talked a lot about demographics already today. We absolutely want to make sure that we're hitting the right demographic of people. We have a lot of different ways that we can tell you what your demographic looks like by creating proposals and running forecasts and looking at your social media uh, participation. Um, Brittany also talked a lot about this as well. We always want to use site retargeting when we can. This is the best top of the funnel product to get people back to your website. So somebody comes and visits your website and they see that ad, we want to make sure that we continue to get that ad back in front of them for brand recall and to drive them back to your website so eventually they convert, purchase a product, you know, book a reservation, whatever that might be. 
Search retargeting is a little bit of a, a different strategy. We want to make sure that we're utilizing keywords that trigger that ad to bring people back to your website as well. And then we want to make sure that we're not wasting impressions. We want to get ads in front of people a certain number of times, but we don't want to you know, show somebody one ad 100 times in a month. We probably want to show them an ad seven, eight times just to make sure that brand recall is there and make sure that we're getting them back to your website. Um, or in your front door too, I should say that as well. Brick and mortar is gonna be huge as also. We wanna make sure we're driving people to the front door as well. Um, and then day party. We, we really don't like to run ads during graveyard hours unless you specifically want us to. You could have a demographic of people that want, you wanna reach between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Totally acceptable and we can absolutely do that. Just something that you wanna talk to us about when we're, when we're looking at your overall strategy. Targeting versus retargeting. Targeting. So targeting is how we reach people behaviorally with that first ad. So we say we want to target people who are interested in fly fishing and they have a specific brand of fishing rod that they like to use. We target that people because they've probably been online shopping or looking around for that. Retargeting is a pixel is based off a pixel that we place on your website. So when somebody visits your website, then they go and they read you know, a news article on whatever channel that might be then we know that they've been to your site, that ad will pop up again, and when they click on it, it brings them right back to your website. Oh, so we just want to make sure that we continue that cycle of retargeting. Do you mind, Chris, if I... Absolutely, so, please. So just to further explain the differences between targeting and yeah. retargeting, yeah, absolutely. the best way I can explain it is that targeting is who we are. Yeah. So your age, where you live, income, your interests, things like that, who you are. Retargeting is an action that you've taken. So when we talk about search retargeting, that's retargeting people based on search searches that they've done. Or site retargeting would be retargeting people based on a website that they visited. So think of retargeting as something that you've done. Targeting is something that you are. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Um, jumping forward, let's dive into some other platforms that we've gone over just in slight detail, or you know, generally, and now we're going to go into it a little bit more detail. Absolutely. So the next thing we're going to go over here is pre-roll video, and like Brittany and Peyton mentioned earlier, pre-roll video is essentially the video that shows up, the video advertisement that shows up before you want to watch your chosen content online. <laughs> so if you go to ESPN.com, for example and want to watch John Rahm win the Masters, highlights of the Masters. Maybe you go to uh, foodnetwork.com and are trying to perfect that recipe for you know, the umpteenth time and need to watch a video about it. This, this pre-roll advertisement is going to show up before that. And you know, something important to know as well is that these 15 and 30 second ads, we really prefer and, and almost require you, have, you, have, you to have both cuts so that we can you know, continually optimize based on those 15 and 30 second um, videos. And so we always take performance in, into account. If we have an ad that's killing it and running really well, we will bid higher, put more money towards that advertisement so that we can get, you know, drive more people to the site and get people to you know, convert on that site as well. You can really think of pre-roll as just the video version of programmatic display. That red-headed headed, left-handed golfer example that he used earlier, we can target that exact same person, but just with a video ad as opposed to a, uh, a static display ad here. And again, as we're going to talk about, continually talk about today, video is super important if you really want to get a longer message across from the customer that you, or across to the customer rather, um, that you might not be able to do with a static, a static ad. So if you have an emotional message, maybe you have a complicated product and you have a you know, really, you really need to explain things so, so that a customer can really get it. All of those are really great uh, for, for pre-roll video and, and the perfect fit, in my opinion. We love stats here, and so we'll throw some stats up about pre-roll and how it just drives click-throughs. Click-through is, you know, in terms of top of the funnel, is going to be your, you know, your most important metric, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, a couple of great, great stats here. The 30-second pre-roll videos have a 87% higher than at, higher than industry, uh, have an 80% higher click-through rate than a display campaign in terms of industry average. And 15-second pre-roll videos have a 371% higher click-through rate than a display campaign. That is really showing you the power of it there. Um, again, one thing to keep in mind is that 
If we have a 30 second ad that's running really well and that has a higher click through rate, we're gonna you know, bid higher on that. We're not married to our stats. We treat each campaign like an individual and so we will consistently optimize, make sure that these, uh, that these, advertise, these advertisements are bid, cor are bid correctly and so that you get more clicks to your site, more, uh, you know, more real uh, great impressions for you and so that that, you know, that ad spend that you, that you uh, work so hard to, to give us really goes as far as it can. What is that industry average? Whenever you say higher than industry, right? Yeah. Average, right? Indus in that? Industry average click-through rate is, the, is the, basically the percentage of time people click on a display ad, like a regular, a regular static display ad here. Let me make sure everybody can hear me. So a regular static display ad has an average click-through rate of 0 0.06, not a very high number. We take that into consideration, and when you, when you look at pre-roll, that is increasing that number by you know tenfold, eightfold, whatever that may be. We want to make sure that we're increasing that number. So the video content that Brittany and Peyton went through, taking that and utilizing it as efficiently as possible is what we're all about, and that's really what our job is to do on a daily basis: is to ensure that your click-through rate is higher than the national average. So combining display assets with pre-roll is a great way to do that. Uh, that's as a percent, wow. yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, click-through rate on display ads is not very high. And that's why we use it as a branding and awareness tool and not necessarily as your conversion driver. So like a paid search, which we're gonna go to in a little bit more, is really designed to get people to your website and convert on a specific action. Whereas display is like, here's my brand, here's what it looks like, and here's where you can click through to our website. Now we wanna make sure that we use some of that and that's why we talk about the full funnel strategy because we want to include all of those steps along the way. Perfect. So next, we're gonna talk about YouTube. We already talked about YouTube a lot today, but we pulled some pretty interesting stats that I think you guys um, you know, can, can really benefit from here. I think a big one here is that four times. Viewers are four times more likely to use YouTube to find information about a brand, product, or service versus other platforms. People are on YouTube to figure out how to fix a flat tire, to figure out how to clean their drain, right? These are engaged customers. So targeting these customers in the right way by using a, a, a YouTube video is going to be a very, very good way for you to generate click-throughs and to get them to your site. I think that two times is important too. Viewers say that they're twice as likely to buy something that they saw on YouTube. I think that really has to do with the engagement that these you know, YouTube users ha uh, have as well. And 81% as well. Now, I think I wanna take a share of hands because I think this is a little low. How many of you guys here have used YouTube within the past three months? Yeah. That's about there 100. Yeah. That's about 100. <laughs> So, you know, I use the example of my 60-year-old mom who goes down YouTube rabbit holes just like I do. Sometimes they're pretty similar to mine, which scares me a little bit. But, you know, it's not just that 18 to 24-year-old that you think is on YouTube, right? It's everybody in this room. And so, you know, it's a really, really important place to, to you know, get your brand out there and to get awareness of your, your product or service. So, targeting options. They're not exactly the same as pre-roll video or display. That's because, again, YouTube is a Google product. We use the trade desk for everything else, essentially. And so, we, but we still have really granular behavioral targeting, demographic targeting, and geo, geographic targeting as well. So we can get really, really granular in terms of who we're targeting and where we're targeting. All right, so we brought up streaming TV earlier, and I always like to clarify a little bit more about this platform. Let's jump into it. Um, Brittany did bring this up, but I want to go through this in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about streaming TV, we want to talk about the actual, uh, the actual tools that we will be running these ads on. So let's talk about smart TVs. Most of us these days have smart TVs. You can go in, you can pull up Roku on your TV, you can pull up Amazon Prime, or you can download any application you want and utilize that via your smart TV. We want to advertise on any of those ad available applications that are out there. So imagine, you know, picture Roku TV, Fire TV, Google TV, even Hulu has subscriptions that you can purchase that have advertisement on them, and that is all inventory that we have access to through the trade desk. 
Um, we always talk about pucks, sticks, and dongles. So imagine your Roku stick, your Amazon Fire, any of those things that are out there that are going over the top of that, that smart TV or that you plug into your smart TV. Um, we can certainly add through all the, all, advertise through all of those applications as well. Gaming consoles is another one. This is one that a lot of people overlook. Your PlayStation 4s, 5s, Xbox. All of those have streaming capabilities and we can advertise on those same applications through that gaming console as well. But in my opinion these days, the laptops, tablets, and mobile devices is just as important as the smart TV. This is all critical applications that we need to utilize. And I always use the example of, I might have a big screen TV in my living room, but if my five-year-old daughter who kind of runs the house these days comes in and wants to kick me out of there, I'll end up watching on my laptop or my mobile phone. I'm sure it happens to more than just me. So we wanna make sure that we're running ads on all of those devices. That is critical. We can't just advertise on the smart TV. We need to make sure that we're hitting people on those mobile devices as well. Um, so definitely keep that in mind and we will absolutely work to, to incorporate that into any digital advertising strategy that we may end up running for you. So adding streaming TV to a traditional TV campaign. We're not trying to eliminate traditional TV. We want to partner with them. We want to boost recall by utilizing that streaming TV inventory and making sure that we're having the, the most well-rounded digital campaign that we can, or in general, the most well-rounded marketing campaign out there. Um, so definitely something that we consider. And if you are already, ready, run, already running traditional TV ads, then make sure that we have access to that creative. We can cut those down for you. We can work with you to make sure that we can get that inventory on all of the different streaming uh, inventory that we just talked about. Some of the different platforms, we do get asked a lot of questions about this. I don't wanna go too far into the weeds here, but we really have access to all of these different regional networks that you'll find here at the bottom. We can utilize all of the different distributors that are out there, your, your Crackle, Sling TVs, Voodoo, Voodoo Fubo, all of those we have access to, and then we're gonna have access to all of the different content that's out there. A&E, ESPN, CBS, we have access to just about all of it. So certainly wanna make sure that we are taking that into consideration. But again, I'm gonna go back to our behaviors and demographics. That is the most important part of running a digital advertising campaign. We don't wanna go in and select only CBS inventory because you don't know what TV shows your, your audience is watching. We wanna make sure that we take the demographics, geographics, and behaviors into consideration and target those people wherever they are at. So now we've talked a little bit about the top of the sales funnel. Let's start talking about conversions and how we drive people through that sales funnel. There's gonna be a lot of different products here. There's a lot of things going on. Please know that we want to sit down and consult with you on a specific strategy for your particular business. These are general rules that we follow, but we wanna make sure that we're making great recommendations on the products, but everything that we do with you guys is gonna be customized. So make sure that you spend some time meeting with our reps and making sure that we get a customized strategy for you. But when we talk about the bottom of the sales funnel, we are gonna be looking at products like geofencing and device ID, SEO, email, Programmatic display and video can fall into this. That tends to be a little bit higher on the top of the funnel, but we can utilize those to generate conversions as well. Social media, retargeting as we talked about is another big one, and then paid search, which I will go into great detail. That is a very critical piece if you are looking to drive conversions. Next, we're gonna talk about device ID. We call it device ID. It might also be known as geofencing. You might be familiar with that term. Um, but I, you know, of all the products we talk about, I think this is my favorite one. So what device ID is, is the ability to create literally a custom polygon that will draw over any point of interest, any location that we actually want to pull people's devices from. So we can... So one thing that I want to uh, mention as well is that this is a look back product. So we can go as far back as 12 months in the past or as soon as three days in the past. And we have the ability to pull all of, you know, all of the cell phones that we go ahead and, and pick up that were in that location during that period of time. Do you, do you have the ability to look at a certain product? So like if coffee cup, right? You can look at if somebody has been looking at coffee cups over the last 12 months, and then 
So the, yes, we can. And that we would do through a display campaign. And that's and honestly, it's not really us doing it. It's all the different platforms that we utilize right, that right, collect this right. data. We just go in and bid on it. So with device ID, what we're really looking at is where your device has been over the last 12 months. So if you've gone to a coffee shop in the last 12 months and we draw a polygon around it, we can pull your device ID and deliver ads to your device based on where you've been. So the cell phone companies are tracking your movements based off of data location services, which he'll touch on here in a moment. But that is how we tap into that information and deliver ads to those specific devices. So in three days, if I want to geofence this holiday in, yeah. you guys might get some ads. Yeah. So how do we take, you know, we take advantage of location services. That's how we get this data. So maps, even the old school flashlight app, when you had to download a third party flashlight app and it didn't come baked into your iPhone, all of that was always tracking your location. Now you have an option, right? When you first uh, open up an app, app that you downloaded, um, do you want to never track your location? Do you only want to track your location while the app is being used? Or is just your location gonna always be on? I had a really good marketing professor at CU, Go Buffs, and he told me that, hey, if a product or service is free, you're probably also the product. There's, no, there's no better example of that than device ID, right? You download a free app, you get something in return, but we also get your location services so we can serve you targeted ads. So pretty cool technology, right? But how do you really use it? We have a couple of really good ways, really popular ways that a lot of our businesses that we work with um, utilize geofencing. First one is gonna be visitor targeting. So maybe our target, target market is prone to be at a certain location, right? Maybe we wanna target Perg, Purgatory Ski Area, and everyone who's been there from the middle of October, let's say, to last week. That can be a audience of ski enthusiasts, right? Maybe you're an outdoor brand that has a you know, shop downtown there. That is a really important audience to, to reach out to. And you could do it, right, with something like a targeted display product with maybe targeting outdoor enthusiasts. But if you really wanna get hyper-local and hyper-targeted, then device ID will be your product, right? Because we'll then only be serving ads to people who were at Perg over the last few months. Um, conquest visitor targeting, also super interesting here. So that's as simple as you're a coffee shop and you just want to geofence all of the competitor coffee shops in the area and grab those devices who are there in the last six months. Usually people that go to coffee shops like coffee, so it's a really, really good way to uh, you know, target that audience. A Couple of more creepy things, again, just adding it on to you here. <laughs> Our household extension, we don't only know where your device is at a certain period of time, we know where your device spends midnight to 5 a.m., where we assume you live. So we can take that data and essentially expand that audience. Let's say if we you know, picked up my device at a coffee shop, when I go home and you know, I might live with my sister or my girlfriend or a couple roommates, the household extension will allow us to target those devices as well to you know, expand the audience a little bit, but while also being super targeted. Back geo is the last thing. Again, with utilizing that midnight to 5 a.m. data that we have, we can go back to that PERG example. Let's say, right, we want to target everybody at Purgatory, but we don't want to get anybody from New Mexico. We don't want to get anybody from Texas or Utah or Arizona. We just want local Durango people because we have a store downtown. Right, and so we can put our back geo to be Durango so that we'll capture your device at Purgatory, but we'll only serve an ad to you if you live in Durango. Pretty wild. Really good example here of, you know, we, we went to Durango Joe's yesterday when we flew in. Really, really good coffee there. And so if Durango Joe's wants to conquest some visitors, it's as easy as just geofencing all of these locations, creating an audience, and we have the, the ability to target those folks, right? Maybe they have a specialty coffee or a special, spe special event that they want to uh, promote. All really good ways to utilize geofencing. <clears throat> so first thing, more data, more cool stuff we can pull for you guys. Um, audience, the Audience Insight Report is gonna be very valuable, okay? That's actually available before we even run a campaign. So we can strategize, come up with a list of locations to target, 
And then we can pull not only those big numbers, like the amount of devices and the amount of locations that we targeted, we can pull household income, gender, age, how many times these people have been there. And the really great part that I like about this is tying this back into the full funnel strategy is maybe we wanna use that age targeting as our demographic for some other campaigns, right? Maybe we see that our competitors are seeing a lot of, of business from people over the age of 55. Well, that can inform a display campaign to keep you know, adjusting that audience in order for that ad spend to go as far as it can. Um, just a ton of really good information for you guys. And again, all available before we even start the campaign. So we can run this for you guys and really start strategizing with some real data. About to get really wild here. It's the foot traffic attribution report. So this is the really, really, a really good way to get a estimation of ROI from a simple display campaign. So in that example earlier, let's say we geofence purgatory ski area. We'll serve a campaign, serve ads to those folks throughout the month of April, let's say. And then at the end of the month of April, we can set what's called a conversion zone uh, out, you know, uh, uh, over your business. We can geofence your business. And then we can tell you how many of those people that we captured at Purgatory that received an ad actually came into your store over that period of time. Pretty wild. And we can include most, multiple conversion zones as well. So if you have multiple locations, if you, well, that's the main use for it, we can, also, we can separate those out so we can see the amount of lift that this campaign has generated based on you know, each specific location as well. So let's talk a little bit about search engine marketing after device ID, which is always a little eye-opening for everybody. Um, search engine marketing, otherwise known as pay-per-click, PPC, however you want to refer to it, it is really a conversion-based product. So now we've run branding and awareness. We've gotten your name and your business information out there. We've now targeted a bunch of devices that have been at your competitors' locations and we're driving them to your store. However, you also happen to have an e-commerce platform and you want people to make purchases online or you want them to book a reservation or you want them to fill out a form. This is a great way to show up on what we refer to as a SERP or a search engine results page. This is really critical. We always say that the best place to hide a dead body is on page two of a Google search engine page. So, because everybody goes to page one and then they move on. So make sure that you're taking this into consideration. When we look at the examples here, the way this works is that we're going to bid on keywords based off of searches through a Google, <coughs> through a Google search. So somebody types in love sack, or they type in couch, or they type in sofa, whatever that may be. Based off those searches in that particular geographic area, we will then go in and bid on those keywords so that we can appear with your ad based off of those particular search engine results and those particular keywords. So as you type that in, we wanna make sure that the ad for your particular product or service is there. Now we tend to go in and refine this as much as possible. So you'll see that we're building multiple different campaigns. For something like a furniture store, we would probably build out a bedroom, uh, a bedroom campaign or bedroom furniture campaign, living room furniture, um, maybe you know dining room furniture. So we'll have three separate campaigns running. We'll have different keywords for each of them, different audiences for each, because not everybody is going to be fur furnishing their entire house in one fell swoop. We want to make sure that we're getting in front of them as they change their searches, as they start to upgrade everything within their house. The critical piece to search and to, to all, everything that we've talked about today, but specifically SEM, is gonna be conversions and how we track them. Conversions is something that we definitely need to be aware of and what we consider a conversion really depends on your business or your website or, you know, or your store, whatever that may be. We always wanna take into consideration call tracking. Who's been calling you? How have we tracked that information? We can set up call tracking so that we can record phone calls that come in so that you know, hey, this was a, a 30 second call inquiring about our address. That person's more, more than likely gonna be coming to your location. Um, you can also use it for your sales teams or anything like that that you have in house so you can listen to those calls and make sure that people are talking about the products properly and giving great recommendations on everything that's out there. I mentioned form fills earlier, but again, do you have a specific location on your website that you want somebody to fill out information or request additional information? That's what we need to track as well. We want to be able to show you that. We want to be able to show you all of these individually. 
We absolutely want to be able to track e-commerce sales. We've driven somebody to your website. Now we want to make sure they convert. And how do we do that? We either, you know, obviously have a really so solid call to action. We're bidding on those specific keywords related to your business, and then we're driving them to that purchase page. We can track everything down to the thank you page when somebody makes a purchase. All stuff that we can customize for you and that we can work on. And link clicks. I mean, something as simple as somebody clicking on a URL or clicking on the ad and then going to your website. We want to track that whole process from start to finish so that we can tell you, hey, we recommended programmatic display in the beginning, but I know you have video creatives now, so we should incorporate those and probably lean a little bit heavier on those going forward. We are always going to be optimizing and changing a digital advertising campaign. This is not a set it and forget it product. This is a full funnel strategy that allows us to optimize throughout the life cycle of your campaign. We are gonna make product change recommendations. We are going to make seasonal recommendations. All of these things are critical to making sure that your campaign stays effective throughout the course of its lifetime. Um, again, I do wanna talk about conversions a little bit more. All this is only possible through the placement of a pixel. A pixel is something that a web developer that you work with would most likely be e easily able to place. However, our team can certainly help you do that if necessary. For anybody who's familiar with Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager, it's something that we can also work with as well. We can place those pixels for you within your Google Tag Manager. Um, and that just allows us to track mul multiple conversion points. Because as I mentioned two slides back, we don't want to just track clicks to your website. We want to track everything down to that thank you page. And making sure that we have a pixel in place is the only way that we can do that. We also want to talk about how this is site retargeting that we've talked about multiple times today is only possible with that pixel in place on your website. That pixel allows us to know that somebody visited you and then we want to get that ad back in front of them. So next and the last topic that we're going to talk about today is SEO. SEO just isn't a buzzword that you've heard a thousand times. It's a lot more important than that. What it stands for is search engine optimization. And I know we've been talking a lot about targeting towards the consumer. What's the consumer want? What type of custom consumer is gonna come into my store? But for SEO, your customer is actually Google. What SEO does is it makes it easier for your website to be seen by Google for you know, popular terms, to, and for you to show up in ter for, uh, for popular terms and for you to locally um, show up on what we call the local three pack or the top three uh, local results that show up um, when a customer does a search. Here's a little bit you know, better of an explanation or more thorough of an explanation of a search engine result page. And I'm sure you've seen something very, very similar to this in your time on the internet. Um, first, you're gonna get an SEM uh, ad, right? These are those keywords that we purchase that you know, will pump up your, your site to the top there to give customers the most chance to click. Next, you're gonna get local results. These all have to do with your Google business profile and how that's optimized, what reviews you have, what high quality images are in there, are you, you know, responding to reviews. We'll go into more detail about both organ organic and local later. And then finally, you have your organic results. If you were like me or were like me before I, I worked over here, mm -hmm. you would just scroll all the way down to the organic results, right? I thought I was real cool. I thought I, oh, I'm just gonna go away from all this paid stuff and just go straight to the organic results. The fact is that we can optimize those organic results as well by using organic SEO and make sure that those, um, you know, you're showing up by those search terms and from, you, know, you show up in front of the right customer at the right time. When we talk about a full funnel strategy, you know, ideally we would show up in SEM, in local results, and in organic results. If the same business shows up three times here, you're kind of become the obvious choice. If we can't do that, we need to show up here at least once. Next is gonna be local SEO. That is the Google business profile section of that SERP that we just went over. And what local SEO, uh, what local SEO essentially is, is the strategy and process of optimizing the Google business profi profile as well as other business listings to increase that visibility in search for geo-modified or ge geo-implied search terms. So if somebody is searching for auto repair near me or coffee shop near me, they're probably pretty close to going to your coffee shop, right? And so you see that in the stats there, 88% of people searching for a local business will be there within 24 hours. So 
you know, no more important place to be than, uh, you know, make sure that your local SEO is optimized as much as it can be. Ranking factors. You'll hear our team talk about ranking factors a bunch. Google has a secret sauce that they use. They don't like to give it up that much, but we think we found a pretty good, um, you know, percentage basis off of what Google takes into account when they give you a search result. As you can see there, your Google business profile is the most pop, you know, the, uh, the most taken into account of any um, of those, those points that we talk about there. And you know, some of these you can control, some of these are without your control, but our goal is, as there is in life, right, is to control what you can and to make sure that what you can control is as um, optimized and as um, important and good as it can be. So your Google business profile is Google's source of truth, right? It's what Google has and is, you know, it's, it's the thing up on the wall that Google checks. They actually check other websites in order to, uh, to make sure and, and give your, give your uh, you know, post a boost up at the top. So what we'll do as part of um, our local SEO is we'll make sure all of your information, address, city, state, zip, even business, even business name, is consistent across over you know, 60 or 70 pages online so that you, know, you, you obviously don't have the time to make those updates yourself. So we take the time to go ahead and do that to make sure that that uh, Google business profile is as high as it can be, is in that local three pack, and is that obvious choice when somebody is searching for HVAC near me or whatever it happens to be. One other thing that I'll add to this is we always wanna take into account other websites other than Google. So your Yelps, your Bings, all those search engines and results pages that you get on Google really require us to go out and make sure that all the listing sites that are out there, it could be everything from Yelp to the navigation system in your Toyota Tacoma. All those require us to ensure that your name, address, and phone number is correct in each and every one of those places. We can run scans for you that show you it's correct on Yelp, but it is not correct in Bing. It's correct on Toyota's navigation page, but it's not correct on your Google uh, business profile. So making sure that all of that is accurate is critical. Because if somebody looks up your business information and you have an old or outdated phone number, you're obviously sending somebody to the wrong place and you will not be able to track that conversion because they can't get a hold of you. So definitely little things that we need to pay attention to. And in this case, it's all about the details and just ensuring that everything is accurate. Especially if your business has moved addresses ever, you can have yellow pages list your old address. So we need to make sure that something like that is updated very yeah. regularly. Along with reviews, along with high quality images, review responses, in that slide that I showed you earlier, Google takes all of these into account. So it's really you know, important and critical that you have everything built out as possible. Because just like Peyton said, Google likes Google products. And if you have more things posted on Google, they're gonna be more likely to go ahead and bump you to the top. All right, let's dive into organic. We will not go that in depth today because I could speak for another 45 minutes about organic just by itself, and that would be rather boring. When we talk about organic SEO, again, it's how do you show up organically when somebody searches for a product or service similar to yours? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're taking a lot of different things into consideration, but mostly we wanna look at content and all of your on-site optimizations and elements. 40% um, of revenue on average is captured by organic search traffic. That's really important. So we need to make sure that everything is accurate and that the content on your website is getting the right eyes back to your website or in front of Google. Very critical. 46% of all searches are seeking local information. That near me search that Henry mentioned earlier is critical. And when somebody searches near me, as I did for coffee this morning, I immediately went to the place that popped up and had great reviews and results. So definitely very, very critical. So again, we talked about authority, or we talked about content. We talked about making sure that everything on your website is in good shape. Again, we can run organic scans that will show you any errors or backlinking issues that you may have on your website. So again, all information that we can provide to you free of charge, uh, but we do wanna make sure that the authority on your website as well, or is, is relevant and up to date as well. So if you have any backlinks, 
Backlinks is just a fancy term for sources. So you've written an article about something on your website and you've sourced another web page. We want to make sure that that backlink is in great shape and that it's taking you back and forth to the right places. That gives you authority in the area and allows us to create a much better SEO experience for you. So we've gone through a lot. We've gone through the top of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel. But the reality is we have to diversify the tactics that we're utilizing. And so there's a lot of different information out there. On average, it takes about eight touch points for a consumer to convert, whether that be on your website or in your brick and mortar location. So a lot of things that we need to take into consideration and why we will always tell you that everything that we do is going to be a customized strategy built for your business. So with that, uh, that kind of wraps up what Henry and I had to talk about today, but we would love to open it up for questions because I know we went into a lot of detail. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about Yelp? Because I think for most businesses, it sucks. Yeah. And if you try to change, like I have my old business on there because if, you, if I better to change anything, they're going to call me, they're going to haunt me, and then they're going to bury my results. Yeah, and, and hide reviews. Um, how do you, I mean, I'd rather not be on Yelp at all okay. than deal with them. So what, what are your thoughts on it? You know, I think that Yelp is a necessary tool, but only for that name, address, and phone number information that I've seen. I think that people are paying a lot more attention to reviews on Google than they are on Yelp. I certainly know that my habits have changed. I used to use Yelp quite a lot. I was never much of somebody who posted myself, but I did look at some other results just to get inside information about a, you know, a Thai restaurant that I wanted to go to. Do you think to. people are aware of how much it's manipulated? I do think that people are starting to catch on, and that's why I think that Google reviews are taking, uh, th they're just a little bit more important these days. And I think, again, the critical piece here, Yelp being one of those listing sites that I mentioned earlier, is just ensuring that your name, address, and phone number is correct there. But if you have an old business, we may be able to help you get that off. So we might want to have a separate conversation. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, in a couple of uh, slides back, you, you had a, a, a picture that you um, enlarged. And I've been doing this a lot more is like asking questions. Yeah. And then the top result is like a bullet point of those questions. So yeah. Like how, how can you create that to show up? So that would somewhat fall under the SEM category, so the paid search category, because we're looking for those keyword results. But it also is going to be critical that the content on your website reflects what that question may be. So if you're you know, looking for, again, I'm just going to use this because we've talked about it a lot today, you know, uh, white mocha frappuccino near me, something like that. We want, or where can I find a white mocha frappuccino near me? We want to make sure that those questions generate clicks to your website based off of those specific terms that are utilized in that question. And Does then, that make sense? And then Chase, if there's more like content marketing or broader questions, my biggest advice would be that you answer commonly asked questions in your business in the form of a blog yeah. or, or other long form content that gets indexed by Google. Um, showing up as that question answer on an organic search result, just to be clear with everybody, is a pretty tall task. Yeah, yeah. It takes a whole lot of work. Um, but, you know, if you start today, a few years from now, you could be there. And the best way to do it is to genuinely add value and authentically answer what those questions are through content within your website. So as Google starts to index it, you know, there's a chance that you'll show up. Because Google's always changing that algorithm. Um, and we're finding more and more that Google wants us to stay on Google, which is why they're pulling those rich snippets yeah. of uh, your know, question answers and pulling it up. So basically what it is is that you've got to be in the mix. You've got to be at least, you know, playing the so, game. So is it Google that's, that's pulling the information and creating the bullet points? Yeah, so that's why you want the content on your website from blogs or even just like a story or whatever that might be on your website. You want that to have relevant content that utilizes. When I say keywords, I also mean terms. It could be a long form term, like, you know, a question or something like that. You want to answer those questions, those theori theoretical questions through the content and blogs on your website. And that's certainly something that we can help you out with. So we can certainly talk a little bit more about that one off if you like. Um, but yeah, making sure that you're kind of answering those questions before they come up is really critical through the content on your web page. Yes, yes. ma'am. Business 
business, but it's the same business with a different name. Is that an easy thing to transfer and keep your content and keep your Unfortunately, Google doesn't make a whole lot easy. Um, it is absolutely something that we can work with you on. We can typically what you can do if you're savvy enough to to reach out to Google, you can actually submit a ticket to them that it's basically a help ticket that says, "Hey, I'm changing the name of my business," and they should be able to switch that for you. If you're not educated on how to do that, that's certainly something that we can help with, and it's not a really expensive product or anything like that. So, it's it. There are some tricks of the trade that we need to take into consideration. Um, and sometimes it would require shutting down one Google business profile and creating another, but that's not always the case, so I'm not trying to scare you. Yes, please. When you, you reference several times you bid on something, whether it's the device ID yeah. or what does that mean? That's a great question. So when we, as I mentioned, the trade desk earlier, being the stock exchange for digital inventory. So if you go to, I'm just going to say CNN.com, and you look at all of the ad space that's available, so you've got the bars on top, you've got the towers on the side, you've got ads peppered throughout the web, or throughout the web pages, that is available inventory. Think of those as blank spaces, that our operations team goes in and actually bids on that available inventory. So we say we want to take, you know, your ad and we want to place it here, we have to bid on that. We actually have to buy that space. And so our team is constantly going through and bidding on what's going to be the most valuable for your business based off the demographics and behaviors that we talked about in the initial screening of your campaign. So there's a lot that goes on in the back end and I try to keep it as high level as possible, but that's a great question. And, and it's really our team actually going on to this website and bidding on that available inventory. So like an auction? I mean, it's Absolutely. Like a one set price for that space. 100%. And we can bid up or down. Sometimes we have to pay more for that space. Sometimes we can pay less. It just depends on what's available. We tend to prioritize any inventory that's above the fold. So picture a newspaper. Websites don't really have a fold. But we prioritize above the fold inventory because we want to make sure that the viewability is there. And we want to make sure that people are interacting with your ads. That's really the end all be all is, is somebody seeing it? Are they clicking it? And are we driving the right branding and awareness for your particular product or service? But when you say you're bidding on like a device ID geofence or something. Like Think about this. We're only using the device data to find the inventory. The inventory lives in the same place as a display ad, a pre-roll ad. It's all what we just talked about on CNN. We're utilizing device IDs to find your device, but we still have to bid on the available inventory on each application. So how does, if you're gonna use like one of these pre-roll videos, how do you keep track of, how do, how do customers engage with that? How do you see if somebody watched the video or? Another great question. We didn't go in depth in reporting, but we have our we have a uh, we have a, a reporting dashboard called UI Marketing, and it's going to show you every time an ad popped up, where it where it popped up, what impressions we've bid on. It's going to show you what your click through rate is, what your completion rate on a video ad would be. So, did somebody watch eight seconds of that fifteen second ad, or did they watch twenty seconds of that thirty second ad? We want to make sure that that completion rate is high because that means that people are not skipping it. They're watching your ad all the way through. And then we want to look at things like a click-through rate. Did somebody watch your video? Then click on that ad to go to your website. That's all information that is tracked not only through us, but if you have Google Analytics set up, then we can actually do an apples to oranges comparison and say, hey, traffic's going to the right place, but we may want to make some adjustments here to get more click-throughs for you. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yeah. 